now that he's gotten to uh, talk specifics about the book and um, Tishnor himself, the man. Uh, I'm going to have a little fun, and I'm going to uh, to kind of put Tishnor and his work in a um, historical and, dare I say, poetic larger framework. Um, I mean, you know, what, sh what short memories we have. Uh, our collective view of the world, it, it likes to create visions of the past that are free from harm or hate unless it is politically advantageous for us, of course. Now, because of this, our newspapers, our blogs, and television news reports, they, they, they report stories as if America is sort of a tabula rasa, swept clean every night, to be shocked anew every evening by the day's events. Now, when people m bemoan the brusqueness of the new atheists, they, they do so out of some seeming ignorance, and maybe even a willful ignorance, of the old atheists. And I'm not just talking about James Randi. Uh, <laughs> he is an old atheist, but not exactly the type I'm referring to. I hope in this short time, again, to provide this sort of poetic framework, Tishnor and his book are not an anomaly of the early 20th century, but they're part of a larger current of Western radical philosophers and muckrakers who openly took the fight to Christianity and the superstitions of the day. Now, evolution may or may not have planted the seed of faith in our brains and genes, or, you know, faith, of course, being believing in something contrary to evidence otherwise, but Here's a story of our most obvious target, and one you're probably all very familiar with. Um, I won't belabor it too much. In the beginning there was, well, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I don't think anybody really knows for sure. But as dumb monkeys, we want to figure out what that was, what happened. And so we make up stories. Now, this is done, of course, a thousand times over the millennia. And occasionally it's caught hold. And occasionally the people have prospered enough where their story of how everything came to be spread. Well, once you get, why is everything here, then you, know, then, then you have to answer the question is, why are we here? Well, the answer, more or less, is always the same. He did it. <laughs> now, because it was people, dumb monkeys, essentially, who made this creation story up, they needed to add to the story how, after everything else, the invisible, all-powerful, uncreated creator then finished the job by making us. In the Judeo-Christian version of the story, uh, the one we'll be dealing with here, there were two perfect people. Uh, and everything was perfect just as long as those two folks stayed dumb, of course. They had one rule to follow, don't eat the magic fruit. Now, that magic fruit was from the tree of knowledge. And one bite, you'd no longer be the Pollyannas and milksops that the all-powerful wanted to perform as sexless and stupid pets in his garden of perfection. No, the two listened instead to a talking snake. <laughs> and the talking snake said this, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now this story, as accurate to history as the Garfield strip in the Sunday comics, has permeated Western civilization for thousands of years and much of it at the end of sword or threat of bonfire. A central story to, uh, coming from the religion of the Jews to splinter sects around the globe, from the Mohammedans of the Middle East and Africa to Mormons in the Middle U.S. Adam and Eve have varying levels of importance, but they're always present. And of course, the two bite. They, the inevitable baby in the sky through a tantrum, and because man has strayed from his law, his version of paradise made real. So, in short, 
the gist of it that I get. The philosophy espoused in the Invisible God Baby's official handbook is as follows, and I'm paraphrasing here. The world is wicked, the flesh is evil, and thinking is really bad. But this story from the official handbook is old, and it's been told time and again, and it's been changed and misrepresented, and of course misunderstood. But it's only a story, and a fantastic one at that. But that has not stopped those millions and now billions of one-book lovers from using it as an excuse to do what comes quite naturally to all animals everywhere without excuse. That is, to prey upon their fellow man, to help their own above others, often at the expense of others, and all the while congratulating themselves at being righteous and selfless on the path of goodness and love. Now this philosophy to any eyes not distorted by the contradictory claptrap espoused by the Invisible One's book is absurd and often ghastly. Some of them has such, have such a strong response that they de they've decided that not only are they appalled by such human-hating philosophy, but they are angered. In the pious posturing of the religious potentates, they express scorn and ridicule. In the laws put into the mouth of the all-powerful invisible monster, they have proudly snarled, I question all things as I stand before the festering and varnished facades of your haughtiest moral dogmas. I write therein in letters of blazing scorn, lo and behold, all this is fraud. Now we're talking about a skepticism born of resentment, yes. A feeling that a confidence game has been perpetrated on humanity and the skeptic and those he loves have been taken for more than just money. They've been taken for their dignity and the very urges that make them human animals. These are skeptics that not only take a step back to inspect coldly, sternly, objectively, but to accuse, boldly, mockingly, and with derision, a derision reserved for all those things that are thoroughly hateful to the world and the ego. They are Satans. They will not wait idly because they've been offered some sham paradise once they've died, but they will reside in this world, eyes open, in search of knowledge. They have seen Satan not as some pure evil as the followers of Christ would paint him, but as something more dashing, challenging, and often, dare I say, romantic? A certainly kind-hearted humanists and literalistic secularists will bristle at using this mythological figure to oppose another mythological figure however symbolic it might be used. But for me, uh, for some of history's most creative and challenging artists and thinkers, and certainly for the author of the book that my partner has discussed, well, it's a poetic tribute to the individual, the rebel, the world as it is, man as an animal, life as, as finite, fallible, and real. Now these are men who have bitten the fruit, symbolically. They have opened their eyes intellectually, and they have set about learning what God knows, and that is the secret to the world and life itself. In 1676, in Surrey, England, yeoman John Taylor offended the ears of the ruling class by speaking aloud the following words in a fit of hedonistic rebellion. Christ is a whoremaster, and religion is a cheat, and profession is a cloak, and they are both cheats, and the earth is mine, and I am the king's son. My father sent me hither, and made me a fisherman to take vipers, and I ne neither fear God, devil, nor man, and I am a younger brother to Christ, 
an angel of God, and no man fears God but a hypocrite. Christ is a bastard. God damn and confound all your gods. Christ is the whore's master. Now these blasphemies were punished by a mere hour in the pillory. And Leonard Levy claims that the townsfolk afterward carried Mr. Taylor above their heads to the local tavern to get drunk. However joyous the immediate celebrations may have been, the case known as Rex v. Taylor has had long-reaching implications. Lord Chief Justice Hale's brief opinion on the case was reported secondhand, but it reads, Such kind of wicked blasphemous words were not only an offense to God and religion, but a crime against the laws, state, and government, and therefore punishable by the, in this court. For to say religion is a cheat is to dissolve all those obligations whereby the civil societies are preserved, and that Christianity is a parcel of the laws of England, and therefore to reproach the Christian religion is to speak in subversion of the law. Now, these words by Hale have served as the foundation for dragging blasphemers into court in England and later the United States. Even today, the phrase Christianity is parcel of the laws of England has given the religious right precedent to claim, however wrongly, that the Bible is the source of our common law here in the United States. Now, most of the morality tales we've been told, of course, have been tales woven by the advocates of the invisible one in the sky. Stories to, well, largely scare the children and elderly. An apology to the devil. It must be remembered that we have heard one side of the case. God has written all the books. Samuel Butler wasn't the first to note that it's mainly Christians who have written slanderous stories of Satan and wondered who has told the other side of the story. But it was Twain in his Letters from the Earth who puts the following words into the mouth of Old Scratch himself. The Bible is full of interest. It has noble poetry in it, and some clever fables, and some blood-drenched history, and some good morals, and a wealth of obscenity, and upwards of a thousand lies. By aligning oneself with the rebel hero, it is a rebuke to those mired in childish dualism of good versus evil, a morality bereft of subtlety or circumstance. If we are to build a philosophy in the devil's spirit, would not the enemy of dualism advocate non-dualistic thinking? It isn't those who are ignorant of a God that demand this dualism. It is the proponents of a God. For the doers of sin, there is another leader. They choose another patron and pattern. He that commits sin is of the devil. Sin is, devil's do is Satan's domain, his fear, his work, and every sinner is his ally and instrument. The committer of a sin makes himself of the devil's party 